We are so glad that you are here. Uh, thank you. Good happens when a group of people take action in pursuit of justice or a community bands together to solve a common problem or multiple communities join forces to right a societal failure. It is not uncommon, however, for critical initiatives to lose momentum when partial victories are achieved. For our communities go back to our everyday lives and applaud our bravery and tenacity in the shadow of the good fight. But rarely does a good fight result in comprehensive social transformation. Social transformation requires a long-term effort involving large numbers of people, evolving leadership models and styles, high and moderate intensity initiatives, strategy mixed with passion, and the ability to engage multiple generations through multi-tiered communication strategies. It requires a long vision and struggle with equivalent intolerance for lack of immediate justice and reconciliation. And yet, we are a people who like hour-long dramas, or at least miniseries that we can binge watch to resolve all crises within a bleary winter afternoon. As people who are passionate about the formation of progressive clergy leaders and the leadership of enlivened communities of faith, we are torn between a culture that wants clear, understandable answers, problem, plan of action, and resolution, and a theological understanding that lives in the ambiguity and complexity of a humanly flawed church organization and society. How is it that through so many years of feminist, humanist struggle, women are still being raped, assaulted, demeaned, discounted, and paid less in most prominent of companies, institutions, and mission-driven organizations of our society? How is it that despite decades of civil rights and anti-racism initiatives, laws and efforts, we have a president who argue, argues ambiguity of perspectives following a white supremacy rally? How is it that despite over 2,000 years of a gospel teaching that preaches care for the poor and disenfranchised, we continue to demonize the poor as lazy, are scared of refugees fleeing war or torture in their countries of origin, and do so in many cases from the pulpits of buildings with the word church on the sign out front? How is it, even as people of faith, even within the broad umbrella of the Christian church, we cannot find a common message for loving our neighbors as ourselves, where neighbor is defined in the broadest and worldliest of contexts? This evening and throughout this year, we are convening to celebrate an effort at social transformation that began 25 years ago with a brave group of women leaders in their broader, ch as in their broader church began to reimagine institutions where all people of faith were judged and empowered to lead within the church based upon the quality of their thoughts, convictions, and wisdom rather than their gender, which they identified, or that which was assigned to them by an obstetrician at birth. It is most certainly a celebration of a good fight started 25 years ago, but perhaps more importantly, the start of a social transformation that continues from the women who started the effort to the people who today have picked up the effort and the generations to come who will continue the work until we live in a just community and church. Reverend Dr. Sledham will introduce our speaker in a couple of minutes, but something she will likely not tell you in that introduction is the role that Mary Bednarowski has played in the vibrancy of United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. Not because of the roles she has held, nor even through her generosity, but through her deep, 
unwavering faith in the good that is represented by the people and work of United. Soon after I became chair of the trustees, Mary invited me to breakfast. Through that breakfast and through many individual and group discussions since, Mary always holds the eternal flame of a conviction about United. Sometimes through advocacy, at other times through humor, self-deprecation, or passion, she provides the long view that avoids the despair of a good fight lost or the intoxication of a win and keeps a thoughtful focus to the future. She infected me with an understanding of why United must remain vibrant, and for that I will always be grateful, even if some days that gratitude is expressed with less loving words. <laughs> and now I want to introduce Reverend Dr. Janine Sledham. She is a UCC minister whose primary interest is process relational theology. A theologian and teacher, writer and publisher, she has taught at Claremont School of Theology and United Theological School of the Twin Cities. She has, church, she has served churches in California and Minnesota, in addition to being the publisher of Process Century Press. She is theologian in residence at McAllister Plymouth United Church in St. Paul, an award-winning preacher whose online liturgies and commentaries have been used by practicing preachers around the world. She is passionate about eco-theology, prophetic resistance, and a ministry of transformation and hope. A past director of Process and Faith, her PhD is in a philosophy of religion and theology from Claremont Graduate School. We are most privileged by the fact that she is currently teaching a directed study in historical theology at United. Please welcome Reverend Dr. Janine Slotham. Thank you, Lou, and greetings to all of you gathered here this evening. It is my pleasure, my great, great pleasure, to introduce Mary Farrell Bednarowski. These days, a simple Google search readily supplies the basic details of a person's life. These are easy to jot down and to share in moments like these. So I can tell you that Mary Farrell Bednarowski taught at this institution from 1976 to 2004, most notably as a professor of religious studies and the director of the women's studies program. I can tell you that she is an author of numerous scholarly articles and reviews, the author of several books, including American Religions, A Cultural Perspective, The Theological Imagination of American Women, and New Religions and the Theological Imagination. She is also the editor of 20th Century Global Christianity, A People's Perspective. But Mary herself, as you may glean from those titles, has an abiding interest in creativity, imagination, and the power of story. She would be properly aghast at such a plodding introduction. <laughs> Moreover, tonight's uh, event recognizes Mary's role in the historic reimagining conference, and anyone here who was at that amazing, creative, and mind-blowing conference would surely share her reaction. So let me go at this a bit differently. Back in the day, all United students were required to take a first-year course called Theological and Religious Interpretation. Mary, as one of its teachers, was one of the first professors many of us encountered. We found a woman precise in her speech, rigorous in her thought, a bit impish in her humor, and endlessly, infectiously curious. When the buzz went up back then about this conference, something about reimagining Christianity as if women mattered, about reimagining every aspect of the Christian tradition in order to give it new life and meaning, well, it was natural that she would be a part of it. And when she gave the opening keynote address, we were so proud to be her students. 
and what a fitting choice she was for that task. Mary confesses a love of story, especially stories that represent variety in cultural backgrounds, religious traditions, spiritual struggles, and expressive forms. Sorry. And what better way to encourage all of those stories that would be told in the days that followed as we passed the talking stick from one person to another and blessed each other in Sophia's name. And now we gather again, eager to hear from Mary once more, because we need to be hearing Mary once more, given the troubling times in which we live. The certainties we felt back then, despite our reimaginings, have been eroded. We need that wit, we need that humor, we need your wisdom, and we need your stories. It is fitting, in other words, that tonight's Susan Draper White Lecture, recognizing the 25th anniversary of the Reimagining Conference, be given by Mary Farrell Bednarowski, a feminist theologian who throughout her career has shown an abiding interest in the theological creativity of American women. She has shown that interest in that creativity and in that persistence that we are all requiring now. And so, by your leave, Mary. Bless Sophia, dream the vision, share the wisdom dwelling deep within. Gosh, you look lovely, all of you. <laughs> Probably not very dignified to begin a lecture with a little quiet sobbing, so I will, I will spare you that. But before, before I begin, I, I would like us to remember just for a second, for a second, forever and ever, Sally Hill. Sally Hill who said, you know, we should have a Women's Theological Conference. We should do something in the Twin Cities in order to celebrate the World Council of Churches' Decade of Women. Why don't we have a little something? <laughs> and we did. I miss her. If Sally were to walk in the door, I don't think I'd be surprised. She still feels so present to me. I think I would just say, well, Sally, where have you been? <laughs> We're glad you're here. So I think you're going to hear a bit of the same theme that you heard from Janine. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And from Lou. But as my old Latin teacher said, repetition is the mother of learning. <laughs> so I will do a little repeating. I don't know why I was so surprised and discouraged when I reread my 1993 reimagining speech a few weeks ago for the first time in many years. I really was overcome by the feeling that with a few changes for context, I could give the same speech tonight and feel that not much had changed. And even though that old speech was a hopeful one, I didn't feel so hopeful upon rereading it. Maybe it's the political movement we're living through. Do you think so? <laughs> <laughs> With its heartbreaking revelations about the fact that all those ways we have of judging each other and oppressing and excluding each other are still very much with us that we seem to be deeply in retrograde mode. Maybe it's because without really realizing it, I had looked upon reimagining during all these intervening years 
as a kind of culmination of efforts, after which at least the outlines of the eschaton would be evident. Maybe it's because I reread the essays in Pam Jorn's and Nancy Bernicking's Remembering and Reimagining, and remembered not only the joy of the gathering, but the pain of the backlash, our bewilderment that what we thought we had given as a gift to the church was rejected by some as both unworthy and dangerous. I guess we should have seen it coming. I should have seen it coming. I've taught women in American religious history for years. I didn't see it coming. And I think actually it was our innocence that saved us. I don't know if we would have had the guts to do what we did had we not been so innocent. <laughs> not such a bad thing. I encounter the memories of those who felt the sting of exclusion for reasons of what Sean Copeland calls marked bodies. And the wistfulness, but not the bitterness, of women and some men who had worked and planned for years, but who were so busy making the whole enterprise, the whole huge enterprise work, that they couldn't be present at most of the sessions. Maybe it's because last spring, I was asked by the editors of a Catholic publication, one you're unlikely to have heard of, I hadn't, to contribute to an issue on ambiguity, and in particular, an essay about women and ambiguity and the church. The editors and I had several conversations about parameters I thought we were very clear about those on both sides. And I'm convinced that they thought so too. I said yes to the request because for one thing, I wanted to test whether my voice could be heard in a place where I would have to be discerning in ways that I have never had to be at UTS. And whether I could say what I had to say without being careful in ways that would make me feel as if I were compromising my own conscience. I thought I could. I was happy with what I'd come up with until I heard from the editors that they could not publish my essay. Much as they wished they could, <laughs> because it was too feminist. I would have felt a lot worse if they'd said it wasn't feminist enough. <laughs> One of the editors said, welcome to my world. <laughs> now, of course, I want you to murmur just a bit. Well, that is just terrible. <laughs> and I confess that I certainly was not happy about it. But I was surprised to discover that I, I wasn't angrier. I waited a little while to see if I might start feeling furious. <laughs> but what I really felt, I guess, was rueful. I really had not set out to write an essay that the editors, for whom I actually have a lot of sympathy, felt they could not publish. Of course, as a retired person, I had the luxury of not needing this essay to add to my CV for purposes of tenure and promotion. I do not underestimate that luxury. So I'm claiming no virtue here. And I learned something, again, not an experience I'm crazy about, I confess, something I knew in 1993, but that apparently one cannot learn too often that the work of reimagining goes on and on and on, that we need constantly to renew our vows, to resist and insist and persist those same vows I had declared that we must make in 1993. 
I'm pretty sure that Elizabeth Warren got her ideas about persisting from reimagining. <laughs> And then just at the right moment, I got a little shot of inspiration and an implicit call to repent of my gloom in the form of a quote at the bottom of an email from a friend, Patrick Henry, the former executive director of the Collegeville Institute for Ecumenical and Cultural Research. Patrick always includes what the Reader's Digest used to call quotable quotes at the end of his message. And this one came from Ophelia Dahl, the daughter of Roald Dahl and Patricia Neal. The found, she's the founder of Partners in Health. This was cited in an article about her in The New Yorker. Here's what she said. I am unfailingly optimistic. I think to not be optimistic is just about the most privileged thing you can be. People like us don't like to hear that. To not be optimistic is about the most privileged thing you can be. I'm still quoting her. If you can be pessimistic, you are basically deciding that there's no hope for a whole group of people who can't afford to think that way. And I would pluralize that for whole groups of people, us who can't afford to think that way. You push, she said, you push, push, push. Now it doesn't take much imagine, imagination here to leap to metaphors related to childbirth and midwifery with all of that pushing, <laughs> but Another analogy occurred to me as well while I was pondering these things. I overheard my husband giving advice to a friend who is headed there soon on how to cross streets in Vietnam. You really, some of you have had that experience. You really do just walk right into the traffic that swirls around you and you keep going. If you stop, you'll get hit. The bikes and scooter riders and car drivers know how to maneuver around you if you just keep going. Accidents happen if you stop. So with a pounding heart and a faith that feels completely irrational, you just keep going. There is unbelievable relief when you reach the other side. <laughs> Alive. But then, of course, just ahead, there is another street to cross. <laughs> so you leap in again. And I thought, OK, here, toots, repent of your gloom. And besides, I know truly that it would be sad and foolish and self-defeating and even sinful, sinful, <laughs> not to remember the joys of reimagining because they were multiple. Now I'm moving on to something that I'm calling the varieties of women's persistence. If we look at the theological work women have been doing since the 1960s, and of course for centuries before that, we discover over and over and over again, it is clear, to me anyway, that this work has always functioned in two integrated ways. The first is obvious. The work has been done, is being done, for the inclusion and full flourishing of women in their religious traditions and in the world. And not just women, but women and all the particularities of their distinctive communities. And not just women, but men and children, all sentient beings, all of us. The second is not yet sufficiently recognized, in my opinion. The extent to which this work is not 
merely, and of course, merely is in quotation marks, is not merely by women for women, but also participates in vital ways to larger conversations in our churches and in the culture about God, about how we do theology and why we do theology, about who we are to each other and all the multiple ways we're embodied in the world. Thus, the term revitalization in the subtitle of this lecture. And now onto a transition that will take a few paragraphs to work itself out. I'll let you know when it's over. <laughs> And I'll give you some clues along the way if you don't mind stepping into the traffic with me and just keeping on going. In most of what I've taught and written and spoken about on the subject of women and religion, I've used examples from many traditions. Jean is certainly right about that. Protestants of various kinds, Protestants of various kinds and races and ethnic groups. Various communities of Roman Catholics, Jews, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, New Agers, goddess feminists, Christian scientists, theosophists, Mormons. That has been my modus operandi for most of my career. For the sake of inclusion, of course, but also to seek out all the ways that multiplicities break open the binaries of Western culture, to look for the more, to summon many different kinds of wisdom to bear upon the deepest theological questions. What do all these voices have to tell us about what on earth we're doing here? as individuals and communities in this universe filled with sacred presence that we call home. And also, for who knows what reasons, that's the way my mind works. <laughs> for my 50th birthday, some time ago, my dear colleague Clyde Stucco gave me one of those wooden toys with three animals on top. You seen those things? A pig, a cow, and a sheep, as I recall. Those toys where you, you push with your thumb from the bottom and the animals wiggle around and they make noises, appropriate noises. All the voices Clyde said in his card, which I thought was pretty charming. <laughs> For tonight, and after some hand-wringing, I've decided to do things differently. I'm going to focus on women of one generation, my generation, and for many of us, our generation, and on Roman Catholic women, something I've never done before at UTS. Not because I worried I wasn't welcome to, but because I was going in other directions. I think it's a little bit like the anthropologist who goes to a foreign land, comes home and discovers that home has been re-exoticized. <laughs> it's new. So here's my reasoning. The lives of women be born between the late 30s, I could go farther back than that, and the middle 50s, cover developments in the Catholic Church from pre-Vatican pre II times through Vatican II to the present, present. From what I think we could call a pre-modern worldview with a very brief stop from modernity, we Catholics didn't have much time to spend on modernity because we were so quickly into postmodernism. <laughs> Women of my generation, we've seen it all, we've lived it all, and persisted. Those early years gave us a worldview permeated by an otherworldly metaphysics and ontology, immersion in an ancient language 
and elaborate rituals that had not changed since the Council of Trent. We imbibed an extensive theological vocabulary, a system of moral reasoning that was surprisingly sophisticated in many ways, but by that time also outmoded in its, bio its biology and its psychology. And then there was the exhilaration and confusion of Vatican II, followed by the unfolding and unending struggles about women's place in the church. Struggles over ordination, but accompanied by ever increasing numbers of women in theological education and in non-ordained ministries. That's a lot of raw material to work with. So by now, we have span of life materials to learn from this generation, from cradle to grave, and compelling possibilities for opening up some of the inevitable ironies, contradictions, paradoxes, and startling creativity in the work of women who are both insiders and outsiders in their tradition. Catholic women are not alone in this, of course. We're just, I think, distinctive in particular ways. But Catholic women certainly offer studies and persistence. And I have the gift of knowing that my colleagues who will be panelists tomorrow, I see you, I see you, who are younger, and who have different life experiences from mine will author, offer other examples, other generational examples from other traditions of what persistence, persistence looks like as we go forward. I'm going to focus on seven women, some a little more, some a little less. I want to channel their voices to give you some idea of them as white, feminist, womanist, and mujerista theologians whose work relates to issues of gender and race. Women who are deeply embedded in their communities of origin and are at the same time contributing, making major contrib contributions to issues in theology and religious studies. Four of them were at reimagining in 1993. Three have died within the last five years. And in each case, they persisted until weeks, even days, before their deaths. They've never lost hope and they've never lost courage. I've chosen I've chosen them for several reasons. They're all part of something that is going forward in history, an expression theologian Bernard Lonergan often used. The task of bringing theology down to earth, demonstrating that those truths that used to derive their power from supernatural underpinnings are still deeply meaningful for life on this planet. New ways of understanding transcendence. They contribute to probing the questions, what is theology for? How do all the abstractions and rituals and ethical systems matter for the flourishing of all creatures and our habitats? They've spent their lives answering the questions, who cares, what's it all for, and why should we care? They have been powerfully faithful in demonstrating the depth and resilience and breadth at the heart of Catholicism. Elizabeth Johnson has been called reverent, and I think that's exactly the right adjective for her. But with perhaps two exceptions, they've had their fidelity called into question, yet they have persisted. They have continued to do theology in new ways 
for new times. This is the end of the transition. <laughs> I'm going to start with Elizabeth Johnson. Anne Browdy, many of you know, most of you know Elizabeth Johnson, or at least know of her. And I know of several of my UTS colleagues, newer colleagues, colleagues who are non-women, who use her works in their courses. So another little tribute to UTS. Anne Browdy, who's the longtime director of the Women in Religion program at Harvard Divinity School, and who also taught at both Carleton and McAllister, those were her first jobs, once remarked that the names of prominent feminist theologians are household names outside academic circles in ways that the names of male theologians tend not to be. I haven't attested, I have not tested that assertion scientifically, but it works for me to assume that it's the case. Especially when I think about Elizabeth Johnson, who is a sister of St. Joseph, well known to the Sisters of St. Joseph in this part of the world, and today, by the way, is the Feast of St. Joseph, March 19th. And I went to St. Joseph Academy in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and this was always a free day. <laughs> so, not hard to remember. When Johnson has appeared for lectures in St. Paul, audience members truly yell and shriek with joy. The, she's been called the rock star feminist theologians. You just, it just has to make you laugh with happiness. She's had much acclaim since she published She Who Is in 1992 and many subsequent books. But she's also endured what I would call public suffering. Although given the, ex the esteem in which she has held never public humiliation. Her most famous no doubt, book, no doubt, is She Who Is, The Mystery of God and Feminist Theological Discourse. My favorite is Friends of God and Prophets, a feminist theological reading of the communion of saints, 2000 in which she said she wanted to reawaken a sleeping symbol, just as Catherine Lacuna did for the Trinity, awakened a sleeping symbol. I, I love that expression, for the Trinity in God for us. This is a book I loved using during, in UTS courses, TR 101, that I always, almost always, with one exception, team taught. In it, there is a powerful chapter, just as an example, The Darkness of Death, a subject, as Judith Plaskow has pointed out recently, that has not received much attention in women's theologies. I think that's interesting. Not sure where that work will go, but I think we need more of it. In fact, it was the only thing I could find to send to a friend whose son, after many years of mental illness, had committed suicide. She said, I need to read something. I need to read something. There's nothing. There's nothing that's comforting me. And I found that chapter by Elizabeth Johnson, and it comforted her. I'm not going to go on with that. I could. <laughs> There are three items I'd like to offer you from Johnson's vast repertoire of writings. The first comes from a description of her research interests. It's on her Fordham University faculty page. This is what she's interested in. Systematic theology, especially the mystery of the living God, the meaning of Jesus Christ and salvation, Creation and Ecological Ethics, The Dialogue Between Science and Religion, Interpretations of Mary, the Mother of Jesus, and The Communion of Saints, and all of the above, she says, as related to the human dignity of women 
and articulated in feminist theology. Those are pretty traditional subjects. And I love the way that she says they are underpinned by feminist theology. I think at UTS we'd call that integration. <laughs> integration of feminism with subjects that could hardly be more traditional, but that abound with creativity in her treatment of them. Second, I have a few words from her 38-page response to the much-publicized criticism of her book, Quest for the Living God, Mapping the Frontiers in the Theology of God, published in 2007 and called into question by the Committee on Doctrine of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. This was a very public affair, New York Times worthy, and its outlines are well known to many among us. For tonight, I'm only going to quote a few lines that indicate the extent to which Johnson felt called to instruct the bishops, ironies abound, <laughs> about the very nature of theology. That this book was indeed, and now I'm going to be quoting Johnson, a work of theology. It is not a catechism, not a compendium of doctrine, nor does it intend to set out the full range of church teaching on the doctrine of God. Rather, it presents areas of Christian life and study where the mystery of the living God is being glimpsed anew in contemporary situations. Hence the subtitle, she tells the bishops, hence the subtitle, Mapping Frontiers. Her response did not change the committee's mind, but it, and she, received powerful support from multiple communities of clergy and laity. In the understanding of many, the proliferation of this document and her grace and eloquence in response to the experience made Johnson a public intellectual, and I would say a public theological intellectual. And I think you're familiar with all the, the laments we have these days, that there are no public theological intellectuals. I think Johnson is one. Third, Johnson has not stopped teaching and she has not stopped publishing. She continues her quest for how best to articulate her faith in the living God and for new ways to express the nature of the divine in new times. In Ask the Beasts, Darwin and the God of Love, published in 2014, Johnson sets up a dialogue between biblical faith and Darwin's origin of species. And it's not one of those, this is wrong and that is right kind of setups. Claiming that if you ask the plants and animals the response will lead your heart and mind to the living God. You're beginning to catch that living God theme. I think that's what her life is about. So what model of God, we wonder, will further this effect? How shall we speak, she asks, of the overflowing love of the creating, redeeming, recreating God of life in view of evolution. She's not giving up on God. How shall we act toward the natural world in a way coherent with this understanding? She's confident that, I'm quoting, God's creative activity brings into being a universe endowed. These are abstractions. They're probably hard for you to listen to. Hang in there endowed with the innate capacity to evolve by the operation of its own natural powers, making it a free partner in its own creation. I call that reimagining. As to her own free partnership in the religious tradition of her birth, 
and her ongoing participation. When asked, as seems to be inevitable, why she stays, she has answered, if you feel deeply enough, you stay. Not because you're a masochist, but because it's worth it. You're struggling for the soul of something. And now, Ada Maria Esasi Diaz. Ada Maria Esasi Diaz was a native of Cuba and a nun and a missionary in Peru in her early adulthood. She was professor of ethics and theology at Drew University for many years before her retirement. She gave one of the presentations at the 1993 Reimagining Gathering, and she taught a summer school course at United in the 1990s. I don't remember exactly what year. Did anybody here take that course? She was a, oh my gosh, you did. She was a tough cookie, as I recall hearing on the grapevine. <laughs> when she died in May 2012 of ovarian cancer, she was writing a book on justice as a reconciliation praxis of care and tenderness. Ah, uh, justice as care and tenderness. That is lovely, I think. Her obituary headline in the New York Times read, Ada Maria Esasi Diaz, dissident Catholic theologian, dies at 69. The dissidents had to do mostly, I think, with the work that she did for the Women's Ordination Conference earlier in her career. But I remember thinking that she wasn't a dissident at all. The work she did, she did from the depths of her Catholic identity. One time in response to something she'd written, I said, oh, Ada, you're just so very Catholic. Not long ago, I found a note from her in an old folder. Thank you, Mary, for saying that. I try so hard. <laughs> Not just, mm -hmm. Ada Maria is best known as one of the founders and leaders of Mujerista theology that identifies and encourages and helps to develop the theological voices of Latina women that emerge from what she calls lo cotidiano, the dailiness of their lives and their experiences of church. A few years ago, I asked her if she'd write a chapter, chapter on Mujerista theology for a volume I was editing on 20th century global Christianity, part of a Fortress Press's A People's History of Christianity series. She said she'd do it if she could quote extensively from the words of the women with whom she worked and the women she met with each week outside a church in New York. She was their pastor. This is a church that had been closed by the archdiocese. I think she would like it if I quoted them instead of her. So here are some of the words of one of her key informants, Carmen Villegas. Taking over our church so the Cardinal of New York couldn't close it and being arrested after staying for 48 hours, this is the most spiritual experience I have ever had. And Carmen again. I like to speak with God. I do not use formal prayers. But lately, after I turned 40, I feel I need to reclaim what my grandmother taught me. Now one wants to pick it up again. Now we are hungry for what we received when young. Everything is a blessing from God. I think if I do not defend the poor, who is going to do it? And I get up and I speak and I feel very strong. Viega's voice, I think, gives us a powerful example of what Peter Fahn has called the magisterium of the poor. And I would add to that the magisterium of women. Magisterium, 
teaching office is such a majestic word, I think it's a good idea to spread the majesty around. <laughs> and that is what these women are doing, teaching from their lives. I want Ada Maria's words to be heard as well. The following is one of my favorite quotes from her about one of my favorite attitudes toward theology. <clears throat> Quoting Ada Maria, I always tell the students I work with that the main quality of a good ethicist, of a good moral theologian, is humility. That we need to accept the fact that our understanding is always limited and that therefore we need to, our, to say to ourselves time and time again, this is the best I can do right now. Then we have to pray that next time around we will do it better, say it better. Reimagining. And now Margaret Farley. There are not many subjects, I think, that take more courage to write about in Roman Catholic theology and ethics than sexuality, <laughs> an arena of human experience truly fraught with ambiguity, both because of differing theological interpretations of what constitutes good and bad sex and sexual acts, and about the complexity and competing definitions of gender and sexuality emerging from the biological sciences. In 2006, Roman Catholic ethicist and sister of mercy, you're getting another theme here, lots of nuns. <laughs> I think tomorrow I'll have a few things to say about that reality and how that is changing, how younger Catholic women theologians are not so much nuns, they are lay women, mothers who write about those stresses, but not tonight. Sister of Mercy, I think that's where I left off, Margaret Farley, longtime member, now retired of the Yale Divinity School faculty, published Just Love. Not just love, but just love a framework for Christian social ethics. This is a highly regarded book among Protestant and Catholic ethicists, and like Johnson's She Who Is, is a winner of the very prestigious, prestigious, ah, a new word, <laughs> prestigious Grawmeyer Award for Religion in 2008. As you might guess, she also got in trouble with the Vatican. But she was safe at Yale and I think retired by the time that she published this book. She was at one time a PhD classmate of Carol Christ and Judith Plaska, which I find interesting. But they said they, they didn't know her, they didn't see much of her. I have a feeling that's because she was probably living in a convent near the university and did not hang out with the rest of the graduate students. Farley says in the preface of Just Love, I never intended or planned to write a book on sexual ethics. When I began teaching, I did not plan to teach a course in sexual ethics. Agendas in ethics, however, are seldom set by ethicists. They are set by the questions that arise not only among students, but in the wider society. I developed the notions of just love and just sex long ago in response to these questions. But the fuller considerations and proposals that constitute this book were forged through many years of listening, teaching, counseling, studying, and pondering. Farley explains emphatically that hers is not a book that will address or solve all pressing questions about sexual ethics. It's not a book of rules. She says, my aim has been to propose a framework for thinking about these questions. She offers seven norms that I think are worth mentioning. Do no unjust harm. Free consent of partners. Mutuality. 
equality, commitment, fruitfulness, which he does not equate with procreation, fruitfulness in a much broader sense, and social justice, whose basis is respect for persons as sexual beings in society. These criteria are obviously intended to apply to a variety of loving and just sexual relationships. And of course, they have to be interpreted in context. Just Love has received multiple positive reviews, many of which emphasize that Farley works to reduce the suffering caused by so many traditional sexual ethics. And I could say broadly speaking, if we ask what is theology for, certainly one of the things it's for is to reduce suffering, for heaven's sake. So to reduce the suffering that tend to combine outmoded theology with outmoded biology, and from a feminist perspective, to absolutize sexual roles that put women, often poor women, at a terrible disadvantage. In 2017, Farley was honored by women theologians at the Catholic Theology Society in America's annual meeting. In a response, Farley said, we have not gone far enough. We still hear the cries of women through the centuries and today. Ain't it the truth? At the event, Kathleen Cavani, a professor of law and theology at Boston College, and another of Farley's former students, suggested that Pope Francis could learn a few things from her. My own hope, she said, is he would take a few more steps from Margaret's path, especially concerning the role of women in society and in the church. If anyone could show Pope Francis that Christian feminine, feminism is fully compatible with the deepest truths of the Catholic faith, Margaret could do it. In a powerful testimony that Farley is widely and gratefully perceived as working out of the deepest wisdom of Catholicism, another former student, Jamie Manson, said this in a review in the National Catholic Reporter. The title of this was No Justice for Margaret Farley and Just Love. She said, Margaret labor, labored over just love for more than a decade. And I know with certainty that her deepest hope was that the book would help people through their lives, not turn them against the church. In fact, I am one among many Catholic women and men who actually stayed Catholic because she taught us what is most deeply true in our tradition. Margaret helped many of her Catholic students deepen their love for the church's intellectual and sacramental life. Not a dangerous woman. M. Sean Copeland. M. You'll never guess what the M stands for. Mary. <laughs> <laughs> We're everywhere. <laughs> Sean Copeland is an African-American ethicist and theologian who teaches at Boston College. She's one of three million black Roman Catholics in the United States out of a population of 74.5 million. All of us are everywhere. Scary, right? <laughs> in other words, not many. Copeland is eloquent about some of the historic reasons for this reality, particularly the failure of American Catholic bishops to evangelize blacks after the Civil War and to leave that task instead to religious orders, many of whom were African-American religious orders. She suggested in an interview that, in fact, Obama might have become a Catholic. His community organizing office in Chicago was in the basement of a Catholic church or school if there had been more black Catholics to show him the way. She was a Dominican nun for 25 years. She has left the order. And the first African-American theologian to be president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. 
She's the editor of Uncommon Faithfulness, The Black Catholic Experience, and the author, among other books, of Enfleshing Freedom, Body, Race, and Being. One of the major areas of inquiry in Copeland's work is theological anthropology. What does it mean to be human? How can we live the most worthwhile lives? And thus she has a powerful interest in bodies and the ways they are marked for good and for ill. She tells the story of her five or six year old self really seeing for the first time a picture that had always hung in her great-grandmother's bedroom. Who is that, she asked. Her great-grandmother said, Jesus, he loved us and died for our sins. Such, Copeland says, was my first introduction to the crucified Jesus. The elderly woman who answered my question was a midwife and a tailor who knew life and who knew saving. <clears throat> Copeland became a theological anthropologist. She's also an ethicist. She is certain at the age of 12, that the summer she read about the Shoah and realized that government, empire, could have total control over bodies that are marked in particular ways. <clears throat> I could keep you here all night I can see you grow faint. <laughs> <laughs> I could keep you here all night <laughs> with lists of her accomplishments and evidence of her eminence as a womanist theologian. But I'd like to offer you just a bit of her eloquence on the subject of bodies. In the strength of her witness, Jesus Christ in the Global Voices of Women, edited by Elizabeth Johnson, Copeland says in an essay entitled Marking the Body of Christ, the Body of Christ, the body of Jesus provokes our interrogation of the new imperial deployment and debasement of bodies. The flesh of his church is multi-layered pulling back layer after layer, we expose the suffering and groaning, outrage and hope of the victims of history. In them, we glimpse the flesh of Christ and we are drawn by that eros, his radiant desire for us and we too seek to be his incarnation of love of the other, love of others. The body of Jesus of Nazareth impels us to place the bodies of the victims of history at the center of theology. In that same essay, there is a powerful interpretation of the loveliness, the sacramentality, of homosexual bodies. And she quotes Xavier, this is not a name I was familiar with, I had to look him up, S-E-U-B-E-R-T, Subert, Seubert, who turns out to be a Franciscan who writes a lot about theology and art. Wilson, is that a name you know? Xavier Seubert yeah. or Subert? No? Okay, <laughs> moving right along. <laughs> Just somebody I wasn't, you know how that goes. Sometimes you have to look things up. But she's, she's quoting him on the church's admonitions regarding sexual abstinence. To prescribe in advance abstinence and celibacy for the homosexual person simply because the person is homosexual is to say that homosexual bodily existence stands outside the sacramental transformation to which all creation is called in Christ. That is the end of her quote. I would say, in other words, it's a sin to do that. You won't be surprised, but I think you'll be saddened to hear that last fall, Sean Copeland 
decided not to speak at her alma mater, Madonna College in Detroit, about Pope Francis's agenda for social justice. A very conservative group, the church militant, took her words out of context about homosexuality, accused her of supporting homosexuality, and leading impressionable young Catholics into sin. Copeland was not uninvited, as some newspaper articles suggested. This was big news also. She and the college president came to a mutual agreement to cancel the event. Copeland said that this group was not interested in dialogue, and the situation would only get uglier. Out of respect for the Felician sisters and Madonna University, she was not going to put us through that. This is not the church that Jesus founded, said the sister who had invited her. Two months later, Copeland received the very big deal Marianist Award at the University of Dayton that honors the contributions of Catholic intellectuals. Life is mixed. <laughs> When an interviewer for a US Catholic magazine asked Copeland a few years ago what her Catholic faith meant to her, she was clear. I can't imagine myself any other way. I can't imagine not being Catholic. And I don't want to imagine it. It's part of who I am. I know our church is not perfect. It's deeply flawed in some ways. But there is something about it that I'm not willing to let go of. And I love this, I demand that it hold me. There's something very appealing, I think, about demanding that an institution hold us. That same militance, it's not only traditionalists who can be militant, can be seen in Catholic theologians like Mary E. Hunt, the founder with her partner, Diane New, of Water a woman's alliance for theology, ethics, and ritual in Silver Spring, Maryland. They described that enterprise as an international community of justice-seeking people who promote the use of feminist values to make religious and social change. They invite partners who will continue making waves in feminism, religions, and societies, and they do. Mary also gave a presentation at the Reimagining Conference in 1993. She's a frequent writer of columns for Catholic publications, and she is funny and feisty and definitely persistent. In the fall 2017 issue of the Journal of Feminist Studies in Religion, a journal that one simply cannot live without, it really is pretty interesting, in response, this is, goodness, one of those long sentences that one doesn't seek ahead of time. In a response to Carol Christ and Judith Plaskow's collaborative theological and intellectual autobiography called, now this is Mary Hunt's essay that's called this, Cosmic Catholicism in Embodied Conversation, here's what she says. Despite the Roman Catholic Church's infamous, erroneous dicta about women, same-sex love, and other common matters, my earliest formation in that tradition and my current practice as a cosmic Catholic are informed by a limitless flow of energy or spirit that seems to be abroad in the world. Like Carol and Judith, I do not stake claims on transcendence, Afterlife is anybody's good guess. But I acknowledge the power of this spirit or force as shaping and being shaped in history. Naming it is quite another matter. That everything is connected may be a cheap truism, but try proving it wrong. <laughs> All those years ago in 1993, I remember saying in my presentation that we are responsible for our traditions and their theologies. We are not at the mercy of them. I persist in knowing that this much is true, and I am obviously not alone in my conviction. 
I'm going to speak just a little bit about two other women, and then there will be a conclusion. Ah, happy word, right? <laughs> I always at concerts, like the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, I always check to see how long each, uh, each piece of music is going to be, you know, just to be ready. <laughs> or resigned, or whatever the case may be. <laughs> Margaret O'Gara and Anne Patrick. I would like to almost conclude with the tribute to two other Catholic women who persisted to the very ends of their lives, those ends that occurred way, way too soon. Margaret O'Gara, a world-renowned ecumenical theologian, was a professor of theology, a feminist. She did not expend her energy on ordination. She thought it was not coming soon. She had other work to do. She believed in it fervently. She was an ecumenical theologian professor of theology at the University of St. Michael's College, Toronto, and she spent many summers at the Collegeville Institute on the campus of St. John's University, leading consultations and teaching. She was a member of numberless ecumenical dialogues, was like Sean Copeland, the president of the Catholic Theological Society of America and of the North American Academy of Ecumenists, and theological advisor to the Catholic bishops of Canada. She went with them to a conference in Rome and helped them with their theology. She wrote a wonderful book, The Ecumenical Gift Exchange. You can guess from the title her approach to ecumenical dialogue. In an echo of the women I focused on this evening, and a reality that may well be true for many of you as well. <clears throat> Margaret wrote in a book of her essays published posthumously, No Turning Back, The Future of Ecumenism, all about, about all the different and moving ways she learned to pray with her ecumenical partners. And yet she says, we never forget to pray in our mother tongue which is for me the prayer styles and beautiful rhythms of my own Catholic liturgical tradition. No, it is not that we forget our mother tongue, but with Charles Wesley we can sing within ourselves, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my Redeemer's praises. And we can rejoice in the many tongues used by Christians all around us. I don't think Margaret would mind my amending that to include traditions other than Christianity as well. And sometimes, Margaret points out, we depend on others to help us speak our mother tongues. In that same book of essays published after her death, this one, No Turning Back, Margaret tells the story of a late night session at a bilateral dialogue. It was after midnight, the topic was complex and important. Her group needed to offer a statement the next day and she was so tired, she just could not find the words to articulate what she needed to say. Suddenly, gently, Margaret tells us, my two disciples' colleagues began formulating the Roman Catholic position. This was my position, but they said it for me. Accurately and sympathetically, they found for me the right words to express the position of my church communion when I myself could not find them. I love that story. It fits with the spirit of the reimagining community. We get by with a little help from our friends. <laughs> And then there is Ann Patrick, a sister of the holy names of Jesus and Mary, not only lots of nuns, lots of different orders, who taught ethics and religious studies at Carleton College for almost 30 years. I think that in itself is pretty interesting. She brought her women and religion class to the reimagining gathering in 1993 and was a longtime friend to the reimagining community. She and Mary Potter, our UTS faculty member or colleague for nine years, 
Do, does anybody, I know Wilson knows Mary. Uh, there are other people who remember Mary. I will tell her people remember her. <laughs> they used to sit in the library together and work side by side on their dissertations for the University of Chicago. Anne and I used to meet at the Burnsville Mall to talk theology, halfway point, and wring our hands about women in the church and have a good time. Her best known book is Liberating Conscience, Feminist Explorations in Feminist Moral Theology. But she wrote others as well about women, conscience, Liberating Conscience, of course, was about conscience, conscience in the creative process, and Catholic women's church vocations. I think she would forgive me for summing up the spirit of much of her work in this way. You are creative and dynamic adults, you Catholic women. Take responsibility. Keep at it. Persist. She says, it takes an active religious imagination to trust that God is coming to us from the future and with our help is bringing the divine values of justice, truth, and love to greater realization in history. And here are the last two sentences on her book about women, conscience, and the creative process. What problems of our religious and secular cultures call upon the creativity of each of us for solutions today? To what new paths, I wonder, is the eye of love calling us? I'm going to say that again. I really like that. To what new paths, I wonder, is the eye of love calling us? Anne kept working. She persisted nearly until the day she died in planning for a new volume that has just been published on being unfinished collected writings. Oh, lump in my throat. The poignance of that title fills my heart. On the cover is a painting of two Navajo women working on an unfinished weaving that Anne had in her office at Carleton for many years. I bet she thought of it as a holy picture. <laughs> women of my generation traded holy pictures, like Little boys trade baseball cards. We traded holy pictures. I started reading the book yesterday. Among other jewels, it's one of the most sophisticated essays on abortion that I have ever read. And it made me feel as if I were talking to Anne again. Conclusion. Persistence is predicated on the assumption that there is always more. More to be hoped for and fought for. More in the inexhaustible depths of living water in the wells of our traditions. More breadth and depth and resilience and vitality to be discovered. More paths to which the eyes of love are calling us. In this lecture, I've emphasized the work of academic theologians who began their work in the early years of their lives, often without even knowing yet that it was theology they were drawn to as their particular arenas of, arenas of creativity. But of course, it's not only academic theologians who resist and insist and persist. So I am going to conclude for sure this time with a long list that I, scary, long list, that I liberated from Marianne Hinsdale, yet another Catholic woman theologian who teaches at Boston College. Here's what she wanted to remind us of in her 2004 Madaliva lecture. Do you know Sister Madaliva Wolf, St. Mary's of Notre Dame, started the first PhD program for women in the country. Women couldn't get PhDs in theology before this. Mary Daly got her first PhD from this enterprise. Here's what she says. I need to say that a truly thoroughgoing treatment of the topic women shaping theology ought to include the many 
organic intellectuals or local theologians who lead grassroots theological reflection in Christian-based communities, who give spiritual direction and staff renewal centers, who engage in contemplative prayer at monastic communities, who run homeless shelters, parish discussion groups and liturgy committees, who organize church reform movements and community development initi initiatives, who produce the music, art, and architecture that enhance our worship, who serve as religious educators, campus ministers, prison and hospital chaplains, missionaries, catechists, and school teachers, and those who have given their lives as witnesses for justice and peace. And I would say for all those generations of women who make funeral lunches, they are faithful. For all these women too have contributed much to the shaping of theology. We know these women. We have been these women. We are these women. Reimaginers all. We sing in our mother tongues, we teach each other new songs, we hold hands, and we head out together right into the traffic. Forever and ever, amen. Thank you.